Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today I'm back in one of my favorite places in all of the world. And of course, uh, it is uh, no unfamiliar place to those who watch this channel. That is Davidoff of London in the company of great friends, of course, Edward Sahakian, Eddie Sahakian, and today my good friend, dear friend, uh, Sherry Rahman. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And I thought that uh, it'd be fun to uh, enjoy some cigars and some other uh, things that I know that we all share in common. So. Wonderful. Kirby, welcome. And Shari, welcome. Yes. What a joy <laughs> First and, and honor foremost, to have you here. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful and seriously uh, uh, amazing opportunity to be here in such hallowed halls <laughs> of uh, fine uh, all things cigars. Yes. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely humbled yeah. by the experience to be here in the presence well, of you all. The pleasure. Thank you very much. The pleasure is entirely ours. Uh, you're, privilege you're, to have you. You're all very Sherry. kind, but yeah. thank you so much. It's just and been I, wonderful I to be able to. I can't wait to catch a few of your famous smoke rings. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll try. We'll try and see how it goes. <laughs> uh, well, Sherry, of course, is a member of a, a small fraternity of incredibly well-dressed men here in London. And I know that uh, you're a passionate collector of many things, uh, cigars uh, being one of them that we share in common. Uh, well, watches. I would say I'm more a passionate smoker, smoker of cigars, right. cigars <laughs> as opposed you to You have trouble collector. collecting them, that's I, right. I, I don't, I, I, somehow I collect cigars and then I just, yeah, the, the next smoking. day I realize yeah, that yeah. they're all gone. Yeah, so, so, uh, so maybe just a connoisseur of cigars and well, not well, a collector. I think that would be more appropriate, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and then uh, a collector of, of fine watches. Of course, you've got an Instagram profile under the, uh, the name Time Mechanic. That's correct. Uh, where you kind of detail um, your involvement there. And you're uh, more than a collector. I mean, you're actually a part of the watch community as a judge uh, and as really an arbiter. As a member of the jury yeah. uh, of okay. the GPHG uh, from last year. But yes, I mean, I've been uh, into watches for a very long time. I'm not, I'm not particularly into cars or uh, other than cigars and watches. That's yeah. really two of my, well, I'd like to say they're my sort of Good, right. bad habits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I've, I've, I've been into watches for a long time. I think I've seriously started collecting about yeah. 12 or 15 years ago, yeah. uh, which was a very, very different time <laughs> to where we are today, yeah. uh, whether it be cigars or cars or yeah. watches or whatever you say. Yes. Well, one must pick and choose their pursuits, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, one of the things I know that we all kind of enjoy about Cuban cigars in particular is their collectability. Right, and I think Havana uh, or Habanos has done an excellent job with their regional uh, and their other uh, kind of annual limited edition releases to create this collectability to them, and also their box dating, which you know they've been doing that long uh, before they started actually doing the regionals and limited editions, and so I thought tonight it might be fun for us to um, talk a little bit about maybe some of our favorite regionals, maybe smoke a regional if uh, mm. we might have any available. Um, and just kind of talk about that aspect of the Cuban cigar culture uh, that I know, especially in London, uh, is quite uh, prominent. May I jump in, Kirby, because you've touched uh, a favorite topic of mine. Um, you know, the limited editions and uh, the sort of standard vintage editions that become available from Habanos, they're widely distributed globally. You can buy them if you find them in, in every market. Regional editions are, are, I think, a more sought after, a more collectible component of, of Habanos releases. Uh, they're unique to every market or, or regional area, and they are an opportunity sh to showcase the less well-known brands mm. that are in that wonderful portfolio. Yeah. Um, and although here in the UK, we sell, of course, just the UK regionals, which are wonderful, they typically come out once a year or sometimes every other year. Um, you cannot be a cigar lover and not hunt out other regionals because so many other markets yeah. are producing extraordinary smokes. Yeah. Well, it's that pursuit that is fun. Yes. Uh, and it's the difficulty in obtaining them that I think makes them even more desirable, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, it's like with watch collecting, right? I mean, <laughs> A little bit, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, watches are watches have come a long way today. I mean, collectability in watches have always been there, as you would have with classic cars or even cigars, like we speak about. But I think today it's really reached a different um, aspect, 
because a lot of people, uh, thanks to social media, thanks to internet in general, mm -hmm. uh, you know, watch collecting has really come very far because it has sparked an interest in a lot of people who were not really, you know, who didn't really know what it was about until mm -hmm. they started reading about these things. And, yeah. and it's the interest that it has managed to gauge in people that has really led to s such a boom, especially post the pandemic in the collectability of watches. Yeah. Um, and I hear that from my collector friends and enthusiasts. Right? So, so today there is, a, of course, the collectors are there, but there's also a large segment of what we call watch enthusiasts mm -hmm. who are really, really very passionate about this whole thing and who really, you know, whose knowledge base is much really far greater than mine in certain aspects. Hard to imagine. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's very possible. You know, I, I say that one of the things I enjoy about the whole watch collecting or the, the watch, uh, that, that sphere of watch collecting is that you learn something new all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's never ending because, and it's not because you haven't read up on it before or you don't know about it. It's because things are constantly changing because a watch is a, like a car or like a, um, any kind of, it's, it's, it's a mechanical uh, object. Mm -hmm. And there are always improvements in technology to make that better and, you know, differences. And so you learn about new mechanisms coming in, new movements coming in, new things coming in. It's, it's, it's all very interesting all the time. So it's always evolving, which is yeah. very nice. So you're always learning something new uh, now or later, whatever works, you know. Mm. You can't just sort of you can't say, oh yeah, well, I've, I've read about that and that's yeah. it. It's not, it's never sort of steadfast and uh, like that, you know, you, you need to expand on it. And, and if you're interested, then, you know, you, you really can, can learn a lot, which yeah. makes it very, very interesting, yes. Yeah. Well, that's what's fun is, you know, of course, you know, always learning something new, right? Exactly. Seeing something new. Well, that also applies to clothes or cigars or yeah. I mean every, every new regional editions that come out or every new limited edition cigars that come out always has a story and yeah. that has become so important today um, I mean you know you guys are in that uh, yeah. sphere and you know that I mean, you know regional editions whether it be Cuban cigars or New World cigars they always have something different to offer in fact what I see today is that a lot of the New World cigars are trying to offer something different mm -hmm. And by doing so, they're you know, trying different techniques or, I mean, I don't know, I mean, you'd be able yeah. to say more using different blends yeah. and things like that to see what's more exciting for people yeah. to try. And even the Cuban cigars, uh, are, you know, they're more regional editions today. They're more limited editions today. Uh, they're more special humidors, which all have little characteristics that make them very special. So, yes, yeah. I think the idea today, especially in that segment, um, uh, of collectability is that obviously collectors are looking for whether it be a cigar collector or a watch collector or a car collector is looking to get something just a little bit different yeah and and that's what i don't want to use the word exclusive because mm. that makes it very um you know it's I, I i wouldn't call it exclusive i would just say that it's trying you know they're trying to be a bit different to give something different to people because that's what people are looking yeah. for yeah that's, that's the difference to yeah. me. Well, Eddie, I mean, as someone that, you know, is in this business every day, right? I mean, of course, all of the UK regionals you would have in this shop. Mm. Do you find that there are, you know, regionals maybe from other countries that, uh, you know, that you've sought out or particularly enjoyed? Yes, uh, yes, there are. Um, the, an unusual markets. I mean, in recent years, Italy produced some spectacular, uh, under the Especion, brand, some spectacular cigars. Um, the Andes as a region, South America, produced one of my all-time favorites, the Contiki, mm -hmm. the one oh, yes. nine. And <laughs> yeah, I love it. Still yeah. hunting in a, in for In a it. cabinet of 50, yes. 48. Yes. Yes. And please, if any of your viewers can no, get I me one, mm -hmm. call me. I'll send you some. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, uh, of course, we have to think of Phoenicia. You yeah. know, Phoenicia is the distributor for uh, one of the largest distributors in the world for the Middle East market principally. Mm -hmm. And um, they've been at it for 40, almost as long as we have, 42, 43 years, um, as we have had the shop here. And um, back in 2019, they were celebrating their 40th anniversary. Sadly, we were not able to join. Things changed a little bit, but the cigar was made. It <laughs> is a stunner. It's called the right. Phoenicia. Okay. And although I don't 
sell it, of course, in the UK. Uh, as a cigar collector, I love it. Really? And mm. I went out and I found myself a few boxes. Really? Okay. And may I, having said all that, <laughs> share it with you? Oh, you spoil us. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have permission? <laughs> it's his cigars. Uh, yeah, this one yeah, I yeah, yeah, It's his cigars. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it is a nod to the uh, Sublime size, which is a 54 ring gauge, but it's not quite that. And of course, um, the only thing more mysterious than, than Cuban cigar factory names is the sizes, they call them. <laughs> yeah. So this one is a 54 by 164. It's the Phoenicia 40th. Wow. Uh, and they've made, I think it's 20,000 boxes. This box is number 130 of 20,000. Mm. So quite an early example. You have your ways. <laughs> you have your ways. <laughs> and if I may, I would be delighted to offer you... May I pick for you or would you prefer to... No, have... please. I mean, uh, by all means. I think this is going to be a good one. It's quite firm, but it looks really well made. Kirby, please. Oh, thank you. Dad, may I ask you to pass this to Sherry. Ah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Eddie. That is a very, very special treat. Oh. Look at that. I know it's a little bit small for you, Sherry. This is probably a morning cigar. <laughs> <but> <laughs> well, you know. Oh, look at the band on it. It's beautiful. Huh? Well, it's a triple banded, right, with the foot, yes. mm. you know? It is. Uh, and actually, I'm quite a fan of this, this foot band they're doing now because one of the problems we yeah. get with the thicker cigars, they tend to crack at the foot. Mm. Um, and this You're right. Helps, they do. No? What would you say is? I, I presume you've smoked these. I might have had one or two. You wanted to. <laughs> so, what, <laughs> how would you rank it in terms of strength? I think it's right there with a traditional um, Ramon profile, i.e., medium to full bodied. Medium to full. But the size gives you, I think, the first third as a as a straight medium. It's not. It doesn't start with with the paps, the pepper, and the and some of the oomph that a shorter Ramon would. Um, it's really, really lovely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we talk about collectability. If yourself or any of your viewers are able to get their hands on these, buy two. Put one away, <laughs> smoke one. Yeah, that's because right. Because it will only get better with Words age. of wisdom, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, it's beautifully rolled. Wow, look at this. It's uh, mm. stunning. Absolutely yeah. stunning. Well, m may I cut for you, please? please? I don't know have my El Casco with me. It's the only thing I would trust with <laughs> such a large ring gauge. I'll go with a very shallow cut. Eddie, uh, am I correct to say that this is one of the largest sizes Raman Alunas has made? Uh, I believe so, ring Dan. Gauge? Yes, I don't Because it's a 54, you said. It's a 54. They don't, I can't remember a 56 Ramon. There might be one, but I can't remember. I don't think I've come across it. No? Now, it's, it's, it's quite a coincidence completely that I actually have a Ramon Iones in my little cigar case here. Oh, do you really? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. I do. Uh, uh, which? Uh, I, that's why I just double checked. And it's also a regional edition. Uh, which one? It's <gasps> the uh, Adriatico. Oh, wow. But I haven't smoked it yet, so maybe you can give me a little bit of uh, details on this one. Well, I haven't smoked that one either. Oh, you haven't? <laughs> so I can... I, well, there you have it. I he can learn confess. something. Yeah. Oh, and what he's trying to say, well, after he smokes one, he will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like the Ramona Jonas has had some really exceptional Completely regionals like lately. Coincidence. It landed up in my yes, cigar. Yes, they have. They, they, they have been a, a very fond choice for the UK market. Simon Chase was a big fan of the, the Ramona Jonas. Um, it means a lot to, to, to the Freemans. Um, it's beautiful. Of course, yeah. Phoenicia. Well, the 225th was a Ramona Yonis. Yes. And the 230th yes. will be. Uh, okay. And the 230 will be as well. Yeah, the private Yeah, the 225th stock. was a fantastic smoke. Now, will the 230th private stock only be available as the humidor? No. no. It will be available in boxes of 25 as well, but it will be available later. Mm. We're not sure when yet. You know, pr predicting, um, predicting release dates for Cuban cigars is, uh, you know, it was like predicting interest rates with Greenspan. <laughs> you know, you had to read the yeah. tea leaves and sort of interpret it's, it's like subtle when you words. Do, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like collectible watches. 
When, when are they going to get released? Although they'll yeah. be. You know, Is it the same problem? Oh, it's it's worse. It's worse these days. It's worse these days. Yeah. What What do you think Sherry has uh, contributed to that? Because it seems, you know, just as with Cuban cigars, not only are watches more difficult to come by, they're more expensive, and less predictable. Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and today's video was brought to you by KirbyAllison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care and luxury shoe care accessories in the world, as well as other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed, like this sovereign grade necktie, pocket squares, braces, socks, and so much more. So if you enjoy the content that we film on this channel, make sure you visit KirbyAllison.com. Well, I think one is uh, supply and demand, which is also the true for cigars, isn't it? Because the demand for cigars in the last few years have really... What a beautiful cigar. Thank you, Eddie. Oh, it's an honor. <laughs> honor to share it with you, with Shari, with my father, of course, with your viewers. I think the problem is, well, it's, there's, there's no problem, it's just, you know, it's very difficult for supplies to keep up with demand. And obviously the world has gone through this pandemic in the last few years, and that has resulted in cut down in production. Sherry, could, could you, could, could you estimate you? a rough yeah, split in the watch world <laughs> between the speculator community who are looking to flip and the true collectors who will buy and hold forevermore? Well, it's very difficult in this day and age, because in all honesty, in the last two or three years, the, the numbers have become very, very blurred. And the reason for the blurring is because a lot of people have come to realize uh, or come to treat collectible watches as an asset class, mm. mm -hmm. which has sort of encouraged a lot of people to come into this trade, mm -hmm. trade, as speculators, mm -hmm. which has also led to the supply and demand conflict yeah. that we see today in the watch world. Mm -hmm. So it's a cause and effect. In a yeah. way, it is a bit of a vicious cycle, yeah. but there is no way to avoid it because it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, certain watches have become very, very collectible, and there is a certain segment of people who are speculators, who are purely in, in this business for investment. I, as a collector, um, I don't like the word investment yeah. when it comes to watches, because for me, it's a hobby. It's yeah. a passion. And I love it for what it is mm -hmm. and what the joy it brings to me. Uh, I'm not looking for any kind of financial gains. Yeah. If that happens on the side, well, then that's a bonus. But fair enough. That's not what is sort yeah. of... Do you sell many of the watches that you acquire? I mean, yes, I do. Uh, I generally like to trade up. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. I well, there are three reasons. I mean, you know, one of the one of my sort of key um, things about collecting watches is that if I stop wearing a watch, mm -hmm. then I know it's time to say goodbye. Okay, uh, it's one of those things. And, yeah. and when that happens, I would usually put my watch in an auction or trade up for something mm -hmm. else. And I do do that. Yes, yeah. I do do that quite frequently. I think that's also part of the, of the, the, fun. Of the enjoyment, yeah. the fun, because you know, you, you, can't, you can't just yeah. go and buy every single watch yeah. you want. It's just not uh, yeah. <laughs> economically or, you know, sensible. Yeah. It's not a very sensible and economical, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it's not an economical thing to do. So I think yeah. the way you get around it is by basically doing all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and, and it's, it's, it does give me a lot of enjoyment from yeah. doing that. Well, I think there's something aspirational. It's mm. nice to kind of always aspire to something nicer or something different or something more complicated. Um, and that kind of trading up allows you to you know, really Yeah, it does. And, and again, you know, as I said, so I generally tend to collect more sort of contemporary and modern pieces. Mm -hmm. I'm not hugely into vintage watches. Uh, and the vintage watch market is also very, very strong, very yeah. mature, and there's a lot on offer. Uh, but again, you know, I, I aspire to learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. From that, and uh, yeah. May I ask what's considered a vintage timepiece? Well, it's very the time difficult frame? these days. I mean, vintage is obviously something which is sort of 
a watch from the 1920s, 1930s, mm. maybe even up to the 1950s and 60s would be considered vintage. Um, but, you know, anything post that, yeah, it's still vintage, I guess. I mean, nowadays, watches from the 1980s, you could yeah. sort of possibly, you know, get away with calling them vintage. All the 1990s would be a bit yeah. too, yeah. Well, my watch is from the 90s. Whenever I purchased it, it was definitely considered a vintage. True. You know, True. Oh, it's watch. Beautiful. Yeah. What, um, what, what is that? I'm sorry well, so, to interrupt you. So this is a, a gift that my wife gave me on my 30th birthday. It's a watch I'd been... Sorry, did you say 21st birthday? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 30th. Um, and it was, you know, Sherry, your, your smoke rings are uh, sorry, legendary. It's a bit of a distraction, isn't it? <laughs> Edward's obviously having a fun time. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you, you need to, you know, at what point do you start blowing smoke rings through his smoke rings? You know? I can't do it. I mean, Shari, yeah. uh, But um, this is a watch I'd been looking at and kind of admiring for a year at a boutique in Dallas. And she surprised me with it. But it's a Chopard perpetual calendar. It's one of my favorite complications with a retrograde date. Yes, right. We saw so that's that. where the hand kind of goes and then swings back. Um, and it's a beautiful, elegant 38 millimeter case, yellow gold, which I'm partial to. Um, and, you know, it was off the beaten path, if you will, which is why I was able to acquire it, um, which is amazing. I mean, this watch, whenever it was new in the 90s, was like at that time a $35,000, $40,000 watch. And, uh, you know, before, you know, the recent, the current era of watch price inflation, mm -hmm. I was able to get this for a fraction of that, um, or should I say my wife? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really enjoyed it. I've got some um, Jean Rousseau bands, with the quick release that I can switch between. It's always very useful. Um, and I, so, I, most of my bands these days have to have the quick release yeah. because I change my bands all the yes. time. Because I think, you know, f for us, we're also into sort of our outfits. I mm -hmm. think a watch complements your outfit. I mean, that's also one of the ways I like to wear my watches is sort of complement my outfit yeah. or, or vice versa for yeah. that matter. And uh, and I think straps today have become a game changer. Oh, absolutely. Because you can literally swap the straps yeah. uh, if, you have a, yeah, if you have one of these sort of uh, quick, quick release, changing yeah. uh, mechanisms on your strap. And then it's a completely different watch. Yeah. It's like, you know, the, your watch is wearing different clothes yeah. and it looks completely different. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a great analogy. It is. I see that, you know, You've got a beautiful timepiece on, and now that you've pointed it out, it's coordinated with your pocket square uh, and some bracelets. <laughs> Would you mind sharing uh, what you're wearing? So I'm wearing a Gégé Le Coud Reverso, which is a very iconic watch uh, for Gégé Le Coud. They've been, uh, they have had it in their catalog for years and years and years, and it's, uh, it's as iconic as a Rolex Daytona or something along those lines. Um, you know, uh, it came about quite a long time ago. Uh, the, the story is um, it was made for polo players uh, because you can flip the side, uh, flip flip the watch like that, and it protects it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because in those days you used to have sort of a, a, a glass on, this, on, the, on yeah. the screen as opposed to sapphire crystal, which keeps it more safer. And when you would play polo, there was a very high chance of the glass cracking. So people would turn the back. Um, what makes this watch very special is it was actually launched for the reopening of the Gégé Le Coup London Boutique, which is just down the road from here on Bond mm -hmm. Street, number 26 Bond Street, okay. where they reopened the boutique. And they took this out as a limited edition of 26 pieces mm. to commemorate the fact that it's number 26 yeah. Bond Street. Mm. Um, that's not where it stops. It also was made with a special colored dial, which is a, sort of a, an ode to the British racing green mm -hmm. with a racing green strap. And what is very interesting is that it's got a, a, a beautiful engraving of the Big Ben mm. and the Houses of Parliament in the back, which was done again to commemorate the fact that this is London. the Jeja London boutique. Um, and uh, again, the Reverso is, is a classic. Uh, for me, uh, it's always been one of those iconic watches of, of all time. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I'm wearing it today, I mean, we, we spoke about it before, is that, you know, it's, it's been a particularly sad week here in, in London, in, in the United Kingdom. Yeah. 
uh, because of the passing of Her Majesty the Queen uh, last week. Uh, it is a very sad, sad, sad moment for everybody. And um, but the relationship with Jeje Lecoud and, and Her Majesty the Queen was that she actually wore a Jeje Lecoud watch at her coronation hmm. in um, you know uh, in 1953 in June of 1953. And it was a very special watch. In fact, it still holds a holds the record for being the smallest mechanical caliber ever manufactured. Oh. It's called the Caliber 101, and it was made by Jeje Lecoud in 1929. And it was put into this cocktail watch, which was embedded with diamonds, for the Queen's coronation. Well, it was a gift to to the Queen from the French president at that time, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and she wore it to her coronation in 1953. And it was, it was basically, it looks like a bracelet. It looks like a, a sort of a diamond yeah. uh, tennis bracelet. Mm -hmm. But it's got, uh, I mean, you have to see, I mean, I wish I had a picture to show you of this caliber. Yeah. It's, 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 tiny. it's tiny. And it's got, literally, you can just sort of see the two hands. See whether or not it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea behind it is in those days, it yeah. was very improper to sort yeah. of look at your watch yeah. uh, in public. Well, you wouldn't so wear it formally. You wouldn't form wear it yeah. formally. So they disguised it in the form of a bracelet mm. so that she could wear it on her wrist. So that's, well. the, that's one of the reasons why. And, and, I, and I, when I had, I had the good fortune of visiting the Jeje Lecoud manufacturer in Switzerland uh, not too long ago, and they have, a, I don't think they have the exact watch, but they have uh, yeah. something similar in the museum mm -hmm. as well. And it's pretty astounding when you see it in, yeah. in the flesh. Yeah. What an amazing kind of timepiece and special story. And uh, well, there's also a little bit more to it. Oh, it's please. It's number 26. It's, 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 they made 26 of it. So I got number 23. Okay. Because that's my daughter's birthday. Oh, wow. So it's sort of... Mm. Even more earmark special. for my for my daughter, mm. as and when she's able to appreciate oh. the watch. Oh, nice! So it's it's a little it's a beautiful uh, yeah. timepiece. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a keeper. It's not something that no, it's uh, definitely not is exactly. going to leave the collection. No, no. Yeah. I think as Patek uh, puts it so eloquently, you never own a Patek. You just True. merely uh, look, look after it. Look after the, yes. the next generation. Yes. generation. So this this yeah. is sort of earmark for my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. What about what about you, Edward? You're uh, you've always got a very elegant watch on your wrist. And um, well, I, I would imagine you've been uh, collecting or accumulating, or as Eddie might say, hoarding, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a long time now. But now tell me about this. It's a beautiful, clearly vintage Cartier piece. Well, I'm not sure if you could call it vintage, but I acquired this. Uh, there was a set. There was this one, and then this exactly the same shape, but a, a, a smaller version mm -hmm. of it as well. Uh, that was for my wife. This was for myself yeah. to celebrate our 10th anniversary. Oh, wow. We were married in 1969, and this was in 1979. We, we caught oh, wow. this. Wow. Because we were in Cannes that summer. Were you really? And we went to that famous Cartier shop yes. in Cannes. Which has been uh, burglared many times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not by you, you might no, add. Not, uh, <laughs> and it's a lovely watch. Uh, the, I've only changed the strap once or twice, but it's again a very beautiful easy. crocodile strap. Yeah, it's very nice, very lightweight, and never been serviced. Really. Is it mechan it's mechanical, I would imagine? That's also it's, one of the things I have with my watches. You just wind it and I, 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 wear yeah, it. I, I, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. it. it works I, I hardly perfectly. service my watches. Yeah. Unless something goes horribly wrong, you don't yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, I feel like I hardly set the time of my watch anymore. <laughs> I'm very particular about that, especially perpetual calendars, because yeah. that's one of my favorite complications. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a little bit, yeah. Fanatical. So if I wear a watch, the time... The moon phase, the date, yeah. the leap year, all of that needs to be correct. I need to Otherwise, recommit myself to I'm, set this. I'm going to have to... Yeah. You know, my watch winder broke. <laughs> oh, well. And um, I finally gave up on trying to keep it, you know, set. And for Christmas, as last Christmas, my wife replaced my watch winder. She's a great giver of gifts. <laughs> and um, But I haven't pulled out the little pin to... Because, I mean, it could take 15 minutes to reset the watch. It takes a bit of time. Yeah. It's fun. That's part yeah. of the fun. That's part of the fun. You know, that's yeah. what I love about it. Train the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, it would be an honor one day to, to pass this on. And I think this is a, a watch much in the same regard as the one you're wearing. True. Uh, that I couldn't ever imagine uh, trading. Yeah. Eddie, it's your time to share. 
Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, whilst I, next. I, I do have a very similarly unsellable watch on my wrist, uh, it, it was a gift from my parents mm. uh, for my 18th birthday, so 1990. Uh, and it, it is a uh, uh, bicolor Royal Oak, one of wow. my favorites. Uh, the quartz movement, which, as I was told by Audemars, uh, when it stops working next time, you can throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> I was very disappointed to hear that, so it's not going to stop working. <laughs> but may I go a little bit tangential, perhaps, because I also have a little a bit of a collection of DuPont lighters. Okay. And pride of place in my collection is actually a lighter that is as close to a watch as you can get uh, without being a watch. Hmm. Back in 2017, I think it was, DuPont was celebrating their 75th anniversary of producing lighters. And they wanted to do something spectacular. So in their Haute Création brand, which is where the designers and the, the makers go nuts and can do anything <laughs> they want, um, they scratched their heads and said, right, let's make a lighter which has everything in it that we can possibly engineer. Um, and they did. And mm. this, uh, this Frankenstein is not the right word because it's a, it's a thing of beauty. Uh, this extraordinary light that came into existence, uh, they only made eight times three, meaning there were three variants. Okay. And in each one they made eight. I was very, very fortunate to secure number one of eight. Really? Wow. And I would love to, to show you that now. That it doesn't come out very often, <laughs> but I'd love to show it to you. And I shall have to don my gloves mm. for this moment because uh, it is essentially an unused lighter. Mm. Would you ever use it? I, will I ever use it? Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, with the right occasion, Fair I enough. think it would be worthwhile. I think the only time you will use it is when you present it to Elvis. <laughs> well, no, no. He's a very lucky man to sell this. <laughs> yeah. it, it is quite a box. Well, it's an incredible box. Can I? You're very kind. I, I shall just rest it actually here. That's probably the safest place. And get anything sharp or uh, <laughs> you know, otherwise metallic away from. Here we are. So the. The wondrous thing about you see, this... See, that's one of the pleasures of collecting watches and lighters, is the unboxing. Yes. Is, is, I almost put the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> you were too distracted by that wonderful <laughs> box. Look at that. I, was trying to I mean, that's like a work of art in <laughs> itself, right? It looks like a safe. It does <laughs> look like a safe. You, you can probably see. It's like a little cupboard. I, I think my daughter yeah. would recognize this as a Barbie cupboard. Mm -hmm. But for me, it is... How many times have you opened this? I feel like this is... Not a... many. Not many. And if I may, I want to just ensure I don't open it, it all falls out. So I'm going <laughs> to yeah. just be very cautious here. Ooh. Oh, yes. There's nothing but a sponge there, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the it. Unveiling. And here we have... Oh, my God, look at that. A little bit of a sponge. Be careful. Yeah. And here we have the lighter itself, which we shall extract from the padding. Oh, and wow. Are you sure that's a lighter? It, well, <laughs> I'm going to put this down here so I can show you more closely and cleverly the... May I set this down right here? Oh, right there. Thank you. I'm going to take off all this plastic. I think this is one of the few times it will come off. It's there to protect it, I think, but who needs that? Mm. That wow. is so ornate. It is. It reminds me of the Patek, uh, you know, pocket watch. The uh, oh, hundred percent. You know, it's. I That's mean, the thing is, it's it's a mechanical marvel. Yeah, and that is one of the reasons why I got into watch collecting is that because you know, I studied engineering and the mechanics of things have always fascinated me. Oh, indeed. And and to to be able to think about your watch, which is a perpetual calendar, which basically tells you the time day, date, leap year, month. Yeah, here we are. So fortunately, <laughs> the combination is not locked. There's actually <laughs> a combination lock. My God, so it's like a safe. Like a safe, which you would need to rotate to three digits, I believe, to, to unlock. Then 
when you do all of that, if you flip it to this side, this is where I think they've nodded to, to watchmaking. Yes. And I think they want to that. intentionally create something that looks a little bit like a movement. Correct. And are those jewels? Yes. Yeah. Oh, look at Oh, my God. Look and at as that. You, as you open through, you get that lovely cycling of the, of the mechanism. Of the mechanism. Yes, it is very much reminiscent of a watch movement. And then inside, you have the very first time that DuPont were able to input a yellow and blue flame. Mm. So this is the precursor to the Legrand. Oh, right. And when gassed and you light it, you're able to use these to adjust from yellow to blue flame and also the, the height of the flame. Mm. It's not gas now, so unfortunately I can only talk about it and not show it to you. And then, of course, it all closes back. Look at that. And this is a palladium with, with gold subskeleton. And number one of eight, made in France. Wow. It looks like something out of a Jules Verne novel. Yeah, look at the bottom. And look at the bottom there. Oh, my God. I love how they've put this sort of skeletal imprint of what is underneath. It's, it's sort of like, you know, you would have in, in, in a lot of watches, you have the back where you have the base plate, which is very ornately engraved to show off the skill set of the watchmaker. And that is exactly what they're trying to... Um, Are you sure that there's not a hidden watch inside yeah. some place? <laughs> it could be. Looks like very much like a watch. Wow. It? it could be. Well, there was a time, uh, I think this was sort of over a period of time, they had watches and lighters go hand in hand. I think Dunhill yeah. made a few of these yes. yeah. table lighters, which also had mechanical yeah. watches in the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very nice. slightly more accessible. Mm -hmm. I know they do it with pens. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they also Watches did it with pens. Cartier did it with yeah. pens. Are there any other examples of uh, of lighters in your collection that you can tell us about? Yes, um, I actually actually have the second mm. iteration of mm. the what they call the Grand Complication, which was released a couple of years later. And by that point, uh, I believe a designer that was involved um, with Richard Millet mm. had migrated to DuPont, uh, or at least worked on the project. And he did that lovely carbon fiber aesthetic that you get with, with Richard Millet. And, and they, because that would be, because uh, they did some, it's interesting to know that Richard Millet, they did some very ornate pocket watches ah. made of carbon fiber, I mean, the special material. Yes. Very modern looking pocket watches. Yes. With very interesting movements inside them. Yeah. So if, if, if the, the watchmaker sort of migrated to DuPont, that would also explain. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and it, it has that, it's a very similar format to this, but of course with a carbon fiber. And again, I was extremely f fortunate to get number one of eight. Yeah. And that one is literally eight. So yeah. perhaps rarer than this beast. Yeah. Um, and did you say that's sort of carbon fiber? Yes, carbon fiber, oh, wow. and I think it's a palladium. It's, it's mm. a sort of, uh, it could look like carbon, but I believe it's palladium. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, but see, that's a very, so this is a very um, traditional looking light. I mean, not traditional, but the, the craftsmanship is very ornate yes. and very traditional, whereas I imagine the next, the other iteration is more futuristic in yes, many ways. Uh, very yeah. well put, very yeah. well put. Yeah. Sort of modernist and futuristic, although it still has the, the moving parts yeah. as the mechanism engages and yeah. so on. Uh, and the lock, of course, and, and a few other slight advancements. Uh, but, you know, n not the most practical pocket light, perhaps. <laughs> no. One for the table, maybe. <laughs> yeah. and not one Unless you have deep pockets. <laughs> Unless you have deep pockets. <laughs> but there uh, we have it. So, yeah. so that, oh, for me, you. is perhaps a bridge to yeah. our cigar world between watches. Yes. And... Did the gloves come with the lighter? Or no, was, and as you can tell, extra, these are a little yeah, bit small on me. So. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. I mean, it really takes me back to, you know, the first watch that really piqued my interest in the beauty and just the, the incredible engineering behind watchmaking was that original paddock. What was the, what was it called? You know, that, that 19, the Grave Super Complicated? The Grave Super Complicated. There we go. It's a, yes. it's a legendary. Henry legendary. They, they made it especially for Henry Graves yeah. Jr. And it's a... In the 1920s, right? It's crazy. But that's Which the is thing incredible that's... that they were able to engineer that degree of complexity in that day of age with no computers. No computers, all done by hand. In a size, well, whatever. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big pocket watch, but even But then, in the same way that this is a large lighter, it kind of true, reminds it me is, of that. It is, and that is exactly what attracts me to collecting watches is the 
the skill that it develops in a watchmaker is linked to the art of miniaturization. Mm -hmm. And that is what makes it so special. I was just referring to your perpetual calendar. I mean, think about it. Yeah. Although yours is more current, yeah. perpetual calendars have been around for a long time mm -hmm. in wristwatches. Yeah. And to think that you're able to look at your wristwatch and tell the day, date, month, moon phase, and leap year, year, leap yeah. year, and it's corrected for leap years. Yeah. And it's all done mechanically without mm. the help of electricity or battery yeah. or any kind of Computer external chip, power yeah. source. It's just unfathomable. Yeah. And and that is what makes it so intriguing. Yeah. Uh, that it's 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 it is an exercise in miniaturization, but more importantly, the mechanics that go. I mean, to think about in, in those days, in the twenties and thirties, a watchmaker would sit down on his workbench and make the drawings of what he's going to create. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's unbelievable, without yeah. the help of yeah. computer-aided design or yeah. whatever you call it. Yeah. But they would do it, and then they would go and make these parts. By hand. By hand, yeah. everything, and then assemble all of it together by yeah. hand. It is just, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's the closest thing to Leonardo da Vinci, yes. right, as a person that we can sort find, of, yes. a watchmaker. Yeah. Yeah. They embody so many disciplines and yeah. skills. Correct. Yeah. Well, to me, just uh, with the modern timepiece, uh, the nostalgia of being able to buy a watch today that's mechanical, that's still made in many regards the same way that it's been made for 100 years. I mean, for me, bespoke shoemaking has that same nostalgia, bespoke tailoring, Correct. You know, watchmaking. Uh, I mean, even the way that a cigar is grown and rolled. I mean, nothing has changed about this other than the ring gauge. The band. The band. Quickly switching back to the lights already. So, uh, you know, I've been collecting watches, so I know a little bit about the whole watch collecting mm -hmm. world and all of that. How collectible are lighters? And is there a very large collecting community of lighters. I know there is quite a large collecting community for pens, for instance, yeah. but how collectible are lighters, do you think? That's a very good question. Because you, you, one of the things that you do is you collect lighters, so. It, it, it's, I believe, a smaller community for sure. And what is deemed collectible, truly collectible, has to be pretty old. Um, and we're going back to you know, early, early 20th century, you know, the Dunhills, the aquarium collections and so on. Um, which are exquisite pieces of art. It's not, I would say, the mechanical brilliance of the lighter per se that distinguishes a collectible lighter. Mm -hmm. I think it's the rarity, the, the artwork around it, the encasement perhaps, um, and the, the maker, of course. You know, a name like Dunhill on a lighter means the world. So interestingly, Patek Philippe also made lighters. Oh, really? And some of these lighters came out in the 70s and 60s, and they have become hugely collectible mm. now. Mm. Uh, first of all, they don't appear in auctions very often. And when they do, they, re they garner yeah, remarkable figures. How much? Well. I mean, we're talking... I mean, uh, some of these lighters, like, uh, I think they, used to, they did a collection of lighters for their ellipse watches, which is sort of an oval-shaped lighter to mimic the, the dial of the ellipse watch. And these came in gold, and some had intricate enameling on them. Some of them can sell for forty, fifty thousand dollars and oh. upwards, hmm. because it's just very rare to get. Yeah. And there is I've never come across any of them. Yeah, no, no. There is. I mean, um, it's around, and now they've become even more so because they appear very less. And when they do, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Amazing. The bidding doesn't stop. Yeah. Hmm. Well, while we're uh, all here in your company, I thought it might be. Uh, it might be nice if you were to regale us a little bit in some of your smoke rings, legendary <laughs> smoke rings oh, of yes. which, you know, well, uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, he is truly yeah. renowned for his ability to form uh, well, a smoke it's, ring. It's, 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 it's an old habit. I don't know. I just, I just picked it up. I, I know Eddie's, Eddie's quiz <laughs> me modesty. over and over again. Yeah. What's the secret behind it? And I just say it's practice. <laughs> you know, Infuriating, but probably <laughs> true. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoy the content that we film here on this YouTube channel, one of the best ways that you can support our ability to film even more great content is by visiting kirbyallison.com, where you'll find the largest collection of luxury garment care, luxury shoe care, and other great clothing accessories for the well-dressed. Also, we have a Patreon page where 100% of the proceeds from our Patreon go to our ability to travel in pursuit of this quality craftsmanship and tradition. So if you love the content, these are two great ways to support what you see here on youtube.com slash Kirby Allison. It's, uh, it's just a, you know, it's just something I picked up. I, actually, it's, it's quite funny. The reason why it, uh, I, I was in, I mean, I sort of got drawn to blowing smoke rings. It was an old Tom and Jerry cartoon that I'd seen. Mm. And I remember sort of Tom smoking a big yeah. cigar and blowing these massive smoke rings yes. and sort of taking that smoke ring and then dunking it in a, in a cup of tea yes. or something. Well, that's what I think of whenever I think of Sherry and his smoke rings. It's like a Disney cartoon of like, you know. Something along those lines. <laughs> Give so us that, one. <laughs> so that, that, that was the inspiration of it, really. But uh, yeah, it's just sort of grown on me. And uh, I don't know. Literally, I don't know how you get the size and density that you do. <laughs> I mean, they're remarkable. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, keep, size of donuts. Well, keep puffing <laughs> yeah. because I, I, I've been in a room with Shari in Cuba, if mm. I may say, where we challenged him to blow the smoke ring up, over, and down on a bottle of water on video, and he did it <laughs> after I mean, a few tries. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, I, I, it was. Remarkable. But the internet doesn't know that, you know. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's just, it's fun as well. I mean, cigar smoking for me is fun. As I said, I'm not too much of a cigar collector. I like to smoke them more than <laughs> yeah. collect. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just an old habit. Shari, what's your favorite cigar for blowing smoke rings with? Well, actually, the one that I'm smoking right now will be one of them, uh, which is not a Cuban cigar. Mm -hmm. as, um, and I'm, I'm, I can't wait to try the Finicia, which you very kindly presented. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's a, the, the one I'm smoking right now is a Padron uh, number no. nine Maduro. Mm. I've always found um, Padrons. I, I generally like quite strong cigars, so Padron being one of the more stronger uh, non-Cuban or New World cigars. Yeah. And um, I just find blowing smoke rings with them quite easy. Mm. Always been. Yeah. I think the construction of a cigar is very important to be able to do that seamlessly. Mm. Yeah. So that's one of those wow. things. You need volume and... You need volume. You need to have a decent draw. I yes. think that's the key. So that you can have enough yeah. smoke. You never know what you're going to get with the Cuban. On propel the it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh. So when are you going to start your master classes in, in smoke ring blowing? You let me know. <laughs> Kirby, can we... Can we, we uh, I think we need some lessons for sure. Uh, well, I don't know if I can... Uh, some I, lessons I, and lots of practice. You know, <laughs> the problem is, is with, you know, with a, with a, a Maduro Padron, I, I don't know if I'd be able to survive the lesson. <laughs> well, gentlemen, this has been a tremendous pleasure. And... Um, you know, one of the things I love about Davidoff of London, of course, is the company. And in this shop, there is always great company. So thank you all. Sherry, thank you for joining us. Thanks. It's, it's been very such much. a pleasure. I'm absolutely you humbled know? by this experience. Fascinating well, for all the information you gave us about the watch as well. You're very kind. No, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very interesting world. And there's so much, you know, yeah. so much information and so much knowledge. To, and, the, and the good thing is that today we, are, we live in a world where the knowledge and information is mm -hmm. fairly accessible which wasn't necessarily the case 10, 15 years mm -hmm. ago. Absolutely, I mean, the internet, I mean, just look at, True. you know, we just hit 500,000 subscribers. Oh, wow, and, you know, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So we're celebrating. You. Yes, so we're celebrating <laughs> the incredible cigar. And, um, you know, but just the availability of information mm. and um, not just information because, I mean, you know, books, of course, have existed forever, but video and interesting, nuanced, niche video content and especially on YouTube, has allowed you know a proliferation of of interests. It's exciting oh, yes. to be able to celebrate that here. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well deserved. Yeah. Well, you're very kind. Yeah, thank you. I, I yeah. know it's not just you, Kirby. Your team are exceptional as well. Yes. And you've put together a remarkable company. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We're honored to be. Well, I'm fortunate for the team, and um, you know I really look forward to the next five hundred thousand.
hopefully over more videos like this. In six weeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you. The pleasure has been uh, exceptional. And um, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah. Always a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I really feel spoiled to be able to stay here late and smoke, uh, I know, I know, you know, I know, here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little naughty, you know. <laughs> we all do. It's a nice feeling. Mm -hmm.